Our next speaker. Uh, describes herself as 99.9% MD, with only one exam left on graduating the Monday after SmackDown. Nice. She is deeply passionate about medical education simulation training, is curious on how we move from frustrated, insecure, and unaware novice to creative and adaptive expert. I'm all curious about that. Uh, she's considered a heroine of France, and her role during the Lancasterian phase of the Hundred Year War uh, and for that, she was canonized as a Roman Catholic saint. So, <laughs> talking about uh, how can students choreograph their own learning, Sandra Biggers. Thank you, Chris, for that introduction, I think. Um, and uh, thank you to the SMAC team for having me here today. It's a great honor, um, especially to speak in front of you. I know there's a lot of amazing educators who also inspire me in the audience. So. I'm very proud to be here and I feel very humble and I feel like one of those moments that Tom just talked about. So, um, a little practical information before we move on. Um, there's my Twitter handle and there's the ScanFilm Twitter handle on uh, the slide. If you want to re-watch or re-read or re-listen to my talk, it will go on the ScanFilm web website uh, within the next few days. So, how students can choreograph their own education. That's the topic I'm talking about. Um, before we move on, um, I have a confession to make. So as Chris just said, I am graduating on Monday. The thing is though, I haven't read a single medical textbook to the end during my time in medical school. Please don't judge me too hard on that before we get to the end of the talk, but I had no choice. I hate reading medical textbooks. I have flipped through pages in sheer panic hours before the exam. I have looked for specific info in the index. I have looked at tables, pictures, and boxes in hope of that being the question they would ask at the exam. But I really wasn't that successful at it. So I had no choice. I had to learn how to choreograph my own education. So before I tell you just how I think students can do that, I'm gonna give you a little task. For just a very brief moment, turn to the person next to you and talk to them about what you think the answer is. Just sit in the yes, no, maybe sofa and answer that question and give a reason to why you think yes, no, or maybe, or yes, if, and I'll take you through some of the education psychology that underpins my answer in just a short minute. is what you think at the end of the talk. So I'm gonna go with one of the answers and assume that some of you are thinking, no, students cannot choreograph their own education. They shouldn't, they don't know what they don't know, they don't know what they're supposed to know, and you can't trust them with that assignment. I think you're somewhat right. I don't completely agree with you, but if we turn to the education psychology, I may call you a behaviorist. And as you can see on the slide, there's your behavioristic boots. And those boots are big and heavy and capable of kicking anyone back in line who steps aside of what you, as the instructor, think is right or wrong. So behaviorism is very much what we know from medical education today. And it's not that I, I am not a behaviorist, so it's not that I think it's right or wrong. 
to make use of behaviorism. I just think we need to pay attention to what behaviorism is and what is good and maybe not so good to use their words about it. So behaviorism is very much a top-to-bottom approach. If you make use of a behavioristic approach, you believe that your learner is a blank page. They don't know anything. Knowledge and education is something you apply to them, and it's your job. You're not a facilitator, you're an instructor. And this, I know many of you have been exposed to behaviorism, and I am exposed to this every day in medical school. And I would like you to maybe start thinking a little bit differently about medical education and education. Um, because all we actually do in this behavioristic approach is train more lab dog MDs. This is based on conditioning. I am telling you that behaviorism is effective. When you test me, I will study. But actually what you teach me is not really applicable in real life. So maybe we should move a little past this. So the other answer could be yes. Medical students can and they should choreograph their own education and to that extent that you actually trust them to do this and believe they will become successful doctors from it. I do agree with you. I also think maybe you're a little bit too optimistic and a little bit too positive, but if I turn to educational psychology, I'm going to call you a humanist. So if you loosen your behavioristic boots for a minute and put on your humanism hat, your approach to medical education will be that students are learners and that what we do in a humanistic approach is that we trust our learners and we allow them to find, find out not only on the topic that they're studying, but also what they are and who they are as learners and how they learn. So this is a good thing. I think I couldn't be giving this talk if there wasn't a little bit of humanist in me. How can I say students can choreograph their own education if I don't believe this is true? So I do. Um, and I do like to be surrounded by people, and I think one of the reasons I'm standing here today is that I am surrounded um, by people who believe that I should go and unleash my full potential, which is also a humanistic point of view. So, the problem with the um, humanistic approach is that it is completely reliable on an intrinsic motivation. And I can also confess to you that there are topics in medical curriculum that I had zero intrinsic motivation towards. So that is why sometimes it's okay to put on your behavioristic boots and like put a test in my future because then I will study. So motivation is important and that it is important that, that you as educators uh, are aware of this. When is your learner intrinsic motivated and when do they need extrinsic motivation? So the problem with both um, the humanistic approach and the behavioristic approach is that none of them includes the skill of reflection. So I know that humanists will ask questions, but they won't really teach you how to reflect. They expect you as a learner to find this out by questioning yourself. And maybe that's something that the humanistic approach lacks. And the behavioristic approach, they don't even believe in reflection. They don't care. They're just going to keep correcting you until the end of your career. So, oh, and so the problem is by using, uh, making use of both the humanistic and the behavioristic approach in medical education today, we actually introduce something that we're trying to avoid. And I know you've seen this slide a thousand times, and I know you know what it stands for. And I'm, of course, talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is what we're trying to avoid. Overconfident, inconfident fools on the top of Mount Stupid. <laughs> but 
But the thing is, in a behavioristic approach, if you look at um, the graph, in, when we use a behavioristic approach, we make situation experts. We make people attend courses like ALS or ATLS, and don't get me wrong, I'm a part of that system too, and I do believe that it has something good to it. But we train people by correcting their behavior, and this is also true for competency-based education and so on. It's all about correcting behavior. So what we're teaching people is how to perform in an ideal world and work as imagined, not work as done. Which means we make situation experts who can perform in clinical practice. It's the same with the humanistic approach. Because you will have students who are very interested in one to topic and will spend a lot of time learning about that and nothing else. And they will be confident that they know. And so will the, so will the learner from the behavioristic approach. They will leave the course and think that they know something. But they don't. They're still at the top of Mount Stupid. So how do we avoid that? Well, we start by realizing that the humanistic approach, the behavioristic approach is fragmented learning. It's learning that is, they may have a lot of learning, they may have a lot of skills, but it's disconnected from the other skills they have and the other learning they possess, and it's disconnected from reality. We need to move on from this. And I guess some of you right now in the room are thinking, well, I know the answer to this. It's constructivism. And in constructivism, in medical education, we have problem-based learning. It's not that I disagree with you, actually. I think there is some good evidence out there that shows that constructivism and problem-based learning may improve performance in clinical context. But I don't think we're quite there yet. So let's take the third possible answer. Yes? Medical students can choreograph their own education if. And let's examine what lies behind that if. First of all, know your learner. Know how they learn. We need to spend a few minutes discussing something I know you're all fond of. What does the learner look like today? So, what is your typical medical student or any student? Well, I'm going to call her a she, and it, I'm sorry, boys, it's just because you know the numbers. Right now, a medical student is a she, so let's call her she. She's a very strong and independent woman. She looks like a leader. I love to learn, but I hate to be forced. So she is going to look outside the curriculum, just as I did. She is also very well aware of how she wants to be taught and, how, and what she wants from being taught or from learning. She is also something else, and that is a concept that we all in here get. She makes use of connectivism, and connectivism is not, it was presented in 2005 as a theory. It doesn't really qualify, but I think it's useful in this concept. Connectivism is when you believe that learning occurs through social interaction, and very often in social interaction using technologies. And everyone in this room is probably tweeting or looking at Twitter or have been a few minutes ago. And we believe this. FOMED is about is a connectivistic approach to education. SMAC is where we meet in real life and connect and learn from each other, where we have a bit more than 140 characters to do it. So when you think of your learner today, know that connectivism is a thing and your learners use this approach to learning so do i that's why i didn't read i went on life in the fast lane saint Edmunds, and every other blog out there so what does science tell us how do we get to because every theory i have presented to you right now has a problem how do we make sure that what we learn by reading our books or blog posts or listening to podcasts or even what we experience in clinic. How do we make sure that we can use this in another context? 
at another time. Well, what does science have to say about this? So now I'm introducing a concept that I think we should pay more attention to in medical education, and that's adaptive expertise. So this is what we should aim for. We once again have a graph, and as you can see, there's a routine expertise on that. So that is what we do today. We teach people stuff. We want them to do it the correct way. We want to make routine experts. But actually, that's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for excellent patient care where our doctors and students and anyone in contact with the patients can take their knowledge, be adaptable with it, and apply it in many different situations. So this is the theory of transfer of learning. So how do we go about that? How do we make sure that everything we know and every skill we have can be put into a different situation? Well, adaptive expertise is a concept where you can do three things. Um, the one thing you do when your learners has learned something is you challenge it, question it. And not only you as a senior to question your student, but also have students question their solution to a problem to each other. Make them realize that there are more than one solution to a problem. Because there is. I mean, we could take any skill or any situation in here and I could put up 10 different experts and they would have different approaches. And there's going to be a lot of excellent care in those approaches. So that is what we need to teach our learners, because we always come up to and be like, how do you do it the right way? So next time a student say, how do you do it the right way? You're going to answer and say, I'm going to show you my way. And then you're going to move to Dr. XYZ and ask them as well how they do it. And then you're going to ask all of your fellow students what they have learned. And then you're going to experience that there are more than one solution to every problem. So when you're do all of this challenging questioning with your students and you uh, encourage them, when you encourage them to try it on their own, make sure you do it in a risk-free environment. We still need to take care of our patients, so hello Sim Center. Do this in a simulation center, but make sure when you do make use of medical simulation that you have a plan for transfer of learning. Just don't simulate one or two times. Make sure you do this by also challenging what you do in a simulation and as a third, God damn it, teach them the art of reflection. Reflect, reflect, reflect. I cannot emphasize this enough. I know you know this from the literature when you do a simulation. Uh, when you make your scenarios, you know you're supposed to allow just as much time for debriefing as for uh, the scenario. Double that, okay? Do less scenarios and do more reflections on the scenarios. Ask more questions. So this is adaptive expertise. This is what I want. This is what I did. This is what I want you to go home and do with your students. So how do you do that and what have I done and what is the environment I was raised in? So make a playground for your medical students. I work at the medical um, a medical simulation center in Copenhagen, Copenhagen Academy for Medical Education and Simulation, and it's a playground. I can come there as often as I want. I am a part of faculty. They have a huge co-faculty of medical students. And I think that you should go back and invite your students to take part of your learning faculty, whether it's in a sim center or somewhere else. Create a playground where we can play, replay, fail, do it again, have all the fun we want, try, challenge ourselves and you. Involve us in making the curriculum. I don't get this. We go to the gym every, I don't know how often you go, three, four times a week. Why don't we join the SEM Center? I seriously do not get this. Why can't I like log on to my computer and go to a cardiac arrest scenario and then go do an asthma scenario and then go do a sepsis scenario every Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? I, I seriously don't get this. And you could have peer teaching. You could make use of your students and sometimes you should make 
use of senior faculty, of course, but I seriously think we should go to the center just as we go to the gym. So another thing we need to remember um, is spaced repetition. I don't get the decision makers and the money people in medical education. They think we can teach people stuff by doing it once. None of what I say right now can be achieved in one scenario. We do need to realize the spaced repetition. We need that. Um, just remember that. The gym. And we also need to realize what Tom also said, that education takes time. I cannot fix it. I cannot make it go faster. Not for me, not for you. I'm sorry, as your learner, it takes time. So that is also one of my main messages. Realize that education takes time. Oh, and then go Socratic on your learners. Every time you realize that they've learned something, question, 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 question in a Socratic way. Do that because we learn from it. You learn something about us from doing it, and learning becomes bi-directional, which I think is important. And by teach us the art of reflection. I couldn't choreograph my own education if I didn't know how to reflect on everything I do and think. Because what I really want you to help me and my fellow learners with is move from being unaware, overconfident, frustrated learners and move towards becoming creative, excellent, adaptive, lean, mean creatures of excellent performance. Thank you. Fantastic. I Thank lost you. control of tweaking all of those pearls. It was so good. Um, what did the rest of the interwebs have to say? Um, so quite a few questions have come through actually. So the first being, how do you avoid being at the top of Mount Stupid in reference to your Dunning-Kruger effect when your learners are in charge of driving their education? So I think, um, I think we do that by realizing that we need as educators to be aware that we need to include more educational theory styles in our way of teaching. I think we're maybe a bit too narrow-minded and thereby introducing Mount Stupid and pushing him up Mount Stupid all by ourselves. So step back, realize that by teaching less and thinking more and reflecting more, we might avoid that. Sure, and just a question for you in reference to, say, the humanistic approach which hinges on the student's motivation and also in reference to Tom's talk where you know coaching is so important for our learners. How do you motivate the demoralised trainee and after exploring the reasons why they might be demoralised? How do you address that as a coach or mentor? So what I've done for myself, I'm not sure I have the correct answer for this, but I've realised that by making use of more different approaches and especially by the connectivism, where I realize that there are a ton of knowledge out there and there are also something I need to become aware of. The things I don't have intrinsic motivation present itself, especially through phone. Um, and that has actually encouraged me to start looking and follow people not only within my areas of interest, but also the ones who can teach me something about something I don't. One solution. I'm not sure I have the answer for that. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? And then finally, uh, it's all very well to try and get students to try and reflect because, as we all know, this is important for professional growth. But how do you ensure they just have good basic scientific knowledge as a fundamental? So I don't think it's that way around. Mm. I think if you still believe that you need a certain skill set before you can do the other, I think some other people also think that it's not the way to go about it. The more I reflect, the more I want to know. The more I realize I don't want to know what I don't know. 
So I think it's the other way around. Yeah, another way of looking at it. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much. Thank you.